you're kind of helping them with their identity. What do they want to project? So if you can just get to, so tell me what you like about that picture. You know, tell me which ones you like. And then that's going to give you some huge cues in your mind to say, oh, okay, I know where some other ones are like that. And it's going to help you really narrow down on what they want rather than you trying to sell every picture. It's just, you can cut out a bunch of stuff and just go straight for what they want. Welcome to Architecture, Design, and Photography. Today we have a special guest slightly outside of our normal wheelhouse. Dr. Robert Rice is a speech communication consultant focusing on helping people to be more engaging, less nervous, and helping them to create a positive environment through the power of words. You can uh, get more of Rob at strategicatmosphere.com. I get a lot of Rob because he's also my brother-in-law. It's great. <laughs> uh, so I thought it'd be really cool to have you come in and talk about uh, the different um, aspects in which a professional photographer would run into uh, issues or could think about uh, just the different types of communication that they're doing. And it's also, uh, in my opinion, I'm a little under-resourced on my natural abilities with communication and to talk to someone who knows more about that and could maybe shed a little bit more light on those areas of potential conflict or uh, opportunities within uh, working with clients and everything else around communication, so. Well, I think that's a really great idea. I was doing a little research on photography. Um, there's, a lot, there's a few people I came across and they said, one of them said he actually spends up to 95% of his time just getting things read, prepared, coordinating, marketing, and only about 5% of the time is actually taking photos. You know, I would, I would probably agree with that, actually, yeah. That's interesting, yeah, I never really thought of it in that way, but yeah, that is true. Sorry, I'm gonna adjust your mic oh, there yeah. a little bit. No problem. <laughs> and, and we have water if you go dry there. This will help us communicate better. You're right, <laughs> well, with them. <laughs> So uh, another th interesting thing I came across with was someone said that when they're actually doing a shoot, their knowledge of dealing with people impacts the situation just as much as their knowledge of the camera controls. So you can actually create an environment. I'd give you camera controls there, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think so. I'd disagree if they went down the path of as much as your knowledge of light and composition. But yeah, that, that's, that's sure, a really good point sure. that they made. I think yeah. that... I'd agree with that. Well, I think it's, it's, some people don't realize, and if we just jump and take something from the world of health, because in a sense, would you say you're kind of an image uh, doctor, it's sort of sorts to say, I mean, you're helping people with their identity. I mean, how do you feel about that? Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't describe myself as an image doctor as much as a, uh, communicator of the aesthetic world yeah, right no, so that's a much better word I think identity when it's not just the image but you're taking an aesthetic identity and you're trying to portray what they want right and okay so there's a you know why do people recommend doctors they did this awesome research and it said rather than people <laughs> picking doctors based off of being able to tell them what they wanted to know so it's like you, you've got heart disease you don't know what's bothering my heart there's something else you want to know more than that, or that would make you recommend you to other people. And that is, it's how you made them feel. So it's not even, you know, do they tell you what you want? Is it, how, is it did you cure me? It's how did they make you feel? So there's something to be said about environments and how you communicate. Sure, like with yeah. a doctor, it's not just that they get you feeling better. It's mm -hmm. that bedside manner. That's what yeah, that, that term that was used. That, and I've, I've found that to be very true and I think for myself, I knew that ahead of time that I did not have a great bedside manner, if you will, and that I would really have to focus on my actual work working for me rather than my, uh, my keen social ability. <laughs> well, you're a lot in better shape just being neutral rather than negative as being positive or negative. Hmm. Because uh, once you start get diving into the negative, um, just go back to the health literature on communication and they say, uh, this was in the news recently. They said that surgeons who are negative to their team and critical and all mm. that stuff, they create not just worse outcomes like with people, but for the patients themselves because they create this atmosphere where right. and you're a creative type. 
I mean, you don't want to stomp on someone's creativity so easily to where they don't feel comfortable, you know, to say, sure. oh, this is what I want. Hmm, that's interesting. And, mm -hmm. and I was also just listening to something where they were talking about um, uh, critical feedback as opposed to affirmation feedback and how it's just our um, our kind of dopamine cycles and everything else are just made to feed off of that uh, positive uh, you know, so they were saying like, if you find your spouse doing something that you like and you want to get more of that behavior, just compliment them on that. And, mm -hmm. and you know, you'll, you'll start to see like too much of it. Or something, you know? So do you have a, um, kind of a summary of why communication is important that you could like in a kind of an intro to communications class? here's why you need to think this is very important or know that this is very important. I have an interesting way to illustrate to the class. I just ask them, so what do you want to do in life? And so let's, let's go to, not that this is statistical research, but you can search Google. And so let's search a couple jobs. What do you want to do? And more often than not, in fact, approximately 90 some percent of the time, any job description that pops up, it's going to say, we want communication skills. So I'll just go and say, who, who mm. is looking for it? And I'll bring up industries, engineering industry. They'll bring up the nursing industry. In fact, actually, uh, I keep going back to health, but there's a lot of deaths and sadly uh, misdiagnoses and um, a lot of medication errors, and it's all because of miscommunication. Mm. So mm. we can do the same thing to ourselves as creative people, um, creating messages, creating pictures, if we just don't get things straight. I mean, you're basically providing a service. Let me capture what you want in the way you want it. And the better you are at pulling out of them what they want, the better you can fulfill mm. that. Okay, so. so don't forget that one. I want to bring that one back out of you on my uh, third question. Mm -hmm. that, that's a really important one because I've, I've been accused by people on site while I was shooting that I just was not listening to what they wanted. And, mm -hmm. and I'm, I say accused, I'm, I'm sure they were rightly identifying <laughs> what was going on. Like uh -huh. they, you know, and I'm, I'm again, uh, just kind of, uh, dull to some of those things. So I think this is a really good conversation for me as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so also then what about nonverbal communications? Like, uh, do you, do you ever hit on those? Uh, like some key things like, all right, here's just five things to think about or three, whatever to like, make sure you consider your nonverbal communications. Yeah. Big time. And that's huge. And you may have heard, uh, you've heard that communication is a 97% nonverbal. Mm -hmm. It's actually false. Uh, but it depends on the situation. Right. It is true when it comes to attitudes and emotions. Hmm. So okay. imagine you have someone walk in and you're like, oh, this is a potential client, or you have somebody who meets you for the first time and you have the ability to create a vibe. And this is right. so important. So like, like an initial portfolio meeting with someone. Oh, that's a great example. Um, or in my, my situation, you know, I came from the world of um, you know, universities, colleges, teaching to students, and I have the ability to make them comfortable by what I do. And there's something called nonverbal immediacy, and that just mm. sounds big, right? Sounds fun. But really, it's just psychological closeness. And there's some so clues. What's psychological closeness? Psychological closeness. It's this kind of this, um, it's a kind of a personal connection that makes people feel comfortable. And, you know, you're somebody who's not off putting. Mm. Um, it's, yeah, it's connecting on an emotional level, and more in a, in a positive sure. way. Like uh, the ability to just naturally make someone feel like you're paying attention and you're interested in them. Yeah, well, we can give some examples, and I think that'll clarify it. All right. Yeah. So one of them, and this is really important, so this is just to help people understand. In the world of teaching, they say if you are somebody who's more nonverbally immediate, and let's just use psychological closeness just for mm -hmm. clarity, um, your students will learn more, they'll think they'll learn more, they'll write you as a better teacher, and they'll come visit you more often. So that's good for the photographer if you want someone to come back to you. Sure, yeah, right. right. So and back to your question, you know, what do we do? Is there an easy way to remember this? And I came up with an acronym called OPEN. Mm -hmm. so we could be open, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can start out with an open posture. Okay. So, sometimes so me sitting here with my arms crossed and my legs crossed pointing away from you is, is a... Eh. 
And now it, I could take it that way. It could just be you being comfortable. Right. But if I see multiple cues, that's a cue for me to say, okay, he's got the arms crossed and he's facing the other direction right. and he's doing something else. I put those together. That's how you make an accurate reading. Hmm. So we can choose whether to do that or not. Right. Um, if we're conscious of it, if we're not, you know, sometimes we're just cold and we cross our arms, but right. we have to remember that someone doesn't know you're cold. They only know that you're crossing your arms. Right. So <laughs> we just have to be conscious of these things. Yeah. So open, start out with an open stance. And when you're teaching, you could do this with anybody. It's just your forward contact. So I could be facing you. And if I'm leaning back or just too excited, or if I'm leaning forward, you know, there could be too much engagement, but they say forward body lean, open, you know, facing their direction, all this stuff. And the closer you are, it sometimes helps people learn better, actually. Now, there's a limit to that, but mm, so right. first be open. Yeah, if you're yeah. too close, you have to pay a lot of attention to your breath. So <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and then P, positive. And a lot of people get this right in some ways, but they forget another part of it, and that is the nonverbal part. Mm -hmm. So we can say words and say, oh, man, that's a really great picture. And, <laughs> but we're not expressing Hey, that is a great picture. Yeah. And people will always, most of the time, believe the nonverbal. My kids, Simon and Grayson, I've, I've always been horrible at receiving gifts. Mm -hmm. Because <laughs> I, I have no ability to uh, be exuberant and or fake it beyond. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, my father-in-law, your dad, I don't think he's faking it. And my wife, your sister, are not faking it, but mm -hmm. they're just so exuberant for me to live up to like that kind of like when they show Papa something and it's like, mm -hmm. oh my God. And, and I'm like, oh my, that is amazing. And they're just kind of like, ah, dad, you know, <laughs> well, <laughs> like I tried. <laughs> see, that shows you that people just have these radars up all the time, you yeah. know, and it's not that you're not being authentic or that's just, you know, some people just have different styles, different personalities. And within reason, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But when mm -hmm. we go off the deep end, there's something called dysemia. And this dysemia. is people. Dysemia. Dysemia. They, uh, they can't translate or kind of uh, transmit emotion. They're just kind of straight blank all the time. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, which, which definitely defeats the P in open, which is being positive, positive. not just with your words, right. but with your nonverbal. Like, mm -hmm. hey, sound happy. I'm glad you had me here today. Right. I am. Okay. And then it's, it's with the words you choose. So words, emotion. But sometimes, Tim Sanders, he wrote a book called The Likeability Factor. And he said, sometimes you just need to tell your face that you're happy too. So... <laughs> Don't forget your hover. <laughs> Huh. So then okay. you have the O um, O P E. We're on E, E uh, eye contact. Now you brought this up earlier. How do you know someone's listening? Mm. When the American culture, the number one way people know you're listening is eye contact. Now for me to listen to something very complex or to even talk, like I just broke eye contact there mm -hmm. and started looking out there because I had to process. Yeah. Like I have a hard time processing with eye contact, and this is something about. I'm not sure if it's introversion or something else, but eye contact can be very difficult for me. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, like, like my friend Caleb, he's just like a eye contact mastro. And then if you look at people who are, um, who, who can be like charismatic cult leaders, they have mm -hmm. this crazy ability for just constant eye contact that never breaks. So you look at like the Hale Bop guy uh, who was on those these weird videos when Hale Bop was going by, and he just if you if you look into cults at all, like there, it's one of the things that you can find with like humans feel that if you can maintain eye contact, your you know eyes are the the thing to the soul. And yeah. there's something weird about me where I have a, a difficult time maintaining eye contact and. I wonder if there is to apply it to ultimately what this is about photography that um, creative types and and everything can can lean towards the introspective type mm -hmm. or introvert types that can have a difficult time with communication and eye contact and all that. But this is good to at least put it on the radar of things you need to at least know that you're present in, in thinking about and, mm -hmm. and making some attempt at maintaining. So. Oh, yeah. And there's, there's definitely ways you can 
show attention by ju just not making the eye contact. So it wasn't really quite natural for me until I started studying communication more and I started learning about eye contact. So then, you know, you can go the other way and you can have too much eye contact and you can just drill holes through people. Yeah, it's a little you know? unnerving sometimes. I know, <laughs> but it's it's really how you connect and that's what's that's what we're feeling. Wow, there's a connection with this person. I'm not mm -hmm. maybe not used to that so much. And it is kind of awkward for some people, but what you've got to learn is, you know, there's times to look, to look and then times to break away. Right. And in public speaking, there's the scenario where they say, you know, have a thought or a sentence for this person, have a thought or a sentence for that person. Mm. So you That's could give them a thought and a sentence, then focus away for a little bit, be thoughtful and reconnect with them. Right. You don't have to stare holes at people, you know. The <laughs> whole speech just staring at one poor person in oh, the front row. Yeah, right. <laughs> so you could do the same thing and, and not just looking at people, but if you just it's uh, there's a name for this but it's basically you're agreeing without the eye contact you're just saying giving little signals mm -hmm, as, as we've already done in conversation right, mm -hmm, right. right. that's exactly right. one of okay. them hmm. so you can do it too often and you know, frustrating but just enough so they know you're with them mm -hmm. right okay so openness uh, mm -hmm. and a lot part of that openness comes from the nonverbals of mm -hmm. just positioning yourself towards the person you're talking about uh, eye contact is kind of part of that uh, openness as well, mm -hmm. it, it seems. Uh, P is positivity. Mm -hmm. So main, th and, and I, I connect with that, that any amount of negativity, it just, it just doesn't stand well in the memory of others about you. Mm -hmm. So even if there's some old parable about, uh, some, someone traveling to another city and the elder was at the city gates, and the people are like, what's this city like? And the elder at the gates was like, well, you know, um, well, what was this city like you came from? And they're like, oh, it's horrible. Blah, 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 blah. And he's like, yeah, this one too. You know, and another traveler comes along, what's this city like? Well, what's the one you came like, what like that you came from? And they're like, oh, it's the best ever, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, yeah, this one too. <laughs> you know, and that attitude determines altitude, you know, to mm -hmm. Zig Ziglar it there. But um, the... Yeah, in a in a portfolio meeting, position myself towards the person, not not uh, assertively, but open to them. Sure. Stay positive. Um, don't talk about the negative parts of. Uh, maybe if you're using something that's framed in the negative in some way, it should end up with, at least here was a difficulty in creating this image, but that's that's how we made a positive out of it or something, mm -hmm. but. To avoid the negative, stay positive. Uh, e was, was that just eye contact? E. It, it was eye contact. Yep. Yeah, which is which is huge. And I think you know a lot of people will just kind of like mm. <laughs> <laughs> look away. Uh, side note: when I when I take a a physical portfolio to a potential client and they're looking through it, I I generally uh, allow them to flip the pages. Because, like, if I'm stepping in there controlling it, I don't know how to read them when they're done with that image mm -hmm. or whatever. Any thought on that, like, from a communications point of view? Yeah, absolutely. Like, I try and sit there and watch them watching it, and I'll try and m make remarks about the images as they're viewing it. But it's always like I'm completely out of my comfort zone, like, doing a little song and dance for them as, as they're, you know, <laughs> and I'm, I'm like, I hope I'm entertaining. <laughs> no, I, th I think there's a wonderful thing that you can do in that situation. And that is to invite feedback. And so you could go about this. So mm. basically you're presenting yourself to them and you want to exude yep. confidence. Mm -hmm. But what you want to do and not this overconfidence, is, or not cockiness. So once probably, we get right? to cross the line of cockiness, we're in trouble because then people don't want to deal with that. Yeah. You know, it kind of shuts them down. It kind of creates a caste system. If you get cocky, mm. as in you're better than them. And right. that would very easily shut some people down. And sure. Yeah. But what I would do, and I think this will be really helpful for you, and this seems to be what you're doing, is to invite the feedback. Because your pictures are speaking for themselves already. And instead of, uh, you know, you explaining, well, oh, this is the best parts about all these things, they're seeing what they like and they want. And you just say, so tell me what you like. Because this is really all about them. You're, you're, you're kind of helping them with their identity. What do they want to project? So if you can just get to, so tell me what you like about that picture. You know, tell me which ones you like. And then right. that's going to give you some huge cues in your mind to say, oh, okay, I know where some other ones are like that. And it's going to help you really narrow down on what they want rather than you trying to sell every picture. It's just mm. you can cut out a bunch of stuff and just go straight for what they want. Right. Yeah. Right. That's interesting. I would, I'd feel, 
how would I feel in a portfolio meeting when they're looking at something and, and are like, so what do you like there? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, well, you can say as you breeze through, I would just put it right in the beginning to help yep. them feel comfortable. So, you know, here, here's a portfolio. I th as you look at this, I want to invite you to just give me some feedback. You know, what do you like? What don't you like? That way we can help you figure out what's going to be right. best for your scenario, situation, right. you know. So just invite it right from the beginning. Well, the, yeah. a little bit of the dynamic of a portfolio meeting is that they haven't quite determined if, if you're a right match for them to begin with. So uh -huh. you might be jumping the gun a little bit there. Sure. If, if you were to do that in that situation to say how I can better serve you would be more of like they'd give you a call back and, and say, uh, we want it, we want you to come in and we'll talk about this job. Mm -hmm. Um, so th in that situation, they're like, all right, we would like to use you, but we want to hone in now on, uh, you know, creating in this specific manner and focusing on, on those things. Right. Um, it, it is a, you know, a, a very kind of not, not fragile dynamic, but it's, it's a, it's an interesting thing to like show up with with everything that you do and all the emotion and, and experience you put into this work and then, you know, judge me. Where is it? You know, it's, <laughs> it's a very odd thing that you have to come across, not cocky, but confident and positive and not scared. And mm -hmm. it's all these weird things, but yeah. Okay. So, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I think one thing that would really help in that in this, you know, if we wanted to approach this kind of like a dating relationship, this sounds like that's that's kind of the stage it's in. Kind of, yeah, a little okay. bit. It's like a first date to a well, degree. The more you, it's, it's like if you're going to go on a date with somebody, you might ask someone else, "So well, tell me, what do you know about this person?" And then you can kind of say, focus on those things when when it happens. So, one way you can do that in interviewing, and this is something that we used to teach our students, was when you're going to and most good eight. Um, most good advisors for students will tell them, hey, so you're going to go to apply at that job. Why don't you jump on their website and see what their values are? So you can look at the mission statement, the value, core values. Um, and photographers, they can also look at all the other pictures they have up there, kind of get a right. taste of their style. Well, yeah, they can do that. Or if you're going to a publication, you can make sure you under know and understand the different articles that are repeated it's in that publication yeah. and then also look in on the you know the person you're going to be meeting with mm -hmm. so find i've always found that if there is some common interest between like if they're into surfing or windsurfing or anything like that it very much just greases the wheel for communication around the business type stuff no that's so. super true and if, if you find something that you have in common immediately people can get more comfortable okay yep. I've got something with this person, you know, they know me a little bit, they, they kind of understand me and they'll, they'll be more comfortable to open up with, you know, their particular details. Right. And I think too, uh, something you said about the judgment, you know, judge me. I think if you can uh, welcome that rather than, this is something that we have to fight and that's, you know, this is my baby. These are the mm -hmm. babies I created. And right. then someone comes in and they're just like, the baby's mm. kind of, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Something's wrong with that baby. <laughs> so. Well, it's interesting, like, the background that I come from before photography architecture is is based highly on a culture of criticism. Mm -hmm. And but it's it's in the light of, look, we have to be critical on these issues because they are extremely complex issues. Mm -hmm. It's an extremely subjective thing that we are practicing here. And it's it's it is uh, very complex. We, and. And if we're not open to that criticism, we're not going to be able to get to the best solution because mm -hmm. the solution is not mathematical. You know, it's, it's a very subjective and, and nuanced thing. Um, and so there, there's, uh, there's a lot of benefit for a multitude of counselors, you know, mm -hmm. to critically look at everything in your portfolio and say, you might really like this image, but it's, it's not connecting with me because of this, that, and the other. And I usually take uh, criticism like that as a, a two strike deal. If someone says something about something once, I take that as an opinion. If another person says it even once, I'll take that as probably a pretty common truth, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, but yeah, the, the, that is a emotional attachment to the babies that you've created the mm -hmm. images that you have to you have to create that kind of um distance to a degree 
to allow for hearing maybe any critical feedback or opinion that other people have on your children, essentially, mm -hmm. you know. So. That's going to make you way more successful because if you can, instead of focusing on defending why you do and how you do it, they don't really, you know, that's not really their priority. Their, okay, their now priority what did is, you just say there? So the focus on... Focus like, this is my baby. You have to stay, well, you know, my baby's beautiful how it is. If we take that time that we we want to use to defend ourselves and the way we did the things. Mm -hmm. We're taking the time away from getting to their needs. So Right. So yeah. you're using that time to get instead of like trying mm -hmm. to say, well, I did this because that instead of trying to defend yourself or your mm -hmm. baby, try and understand what they're thinking and why. And yeah. that's a that's a very strategic approach. Yeah. Plus like it, it, and if you're able to say, you know, hey, all right, there's 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 definitely different styles and if there's a style that suits you better Let's let's move to that. So you have that that example. Well, everyone has different tastes. Yeah. And if we can just be yeah. humble, we all think our taste is the best, right? Well, <laughs> some people. I, I think the people that will improve the most know that their taste is very subjective, mm -hmm. and that there's kind of a, a collective agreement uh, on on people that have a higher common appeal to a degree. That's, that's a, again a really weird. Thing. No, no, I don't think that's weird. I think that's that's that I think that's highly astute in the world of the creative artist. But then you have the other people coming to you who might not realize, well, you know, there's this artistic world where people appreciate more than I do. Most people who come to you, they already have it in their mind probably what they're looking for. It's well, possible. Here's a know. here's another thing with uh working as a commercial artist, which mm -hmm. an architectural photographer very much is. There's there's a degree at which starting out you will be very much a commercial artist mm -hmm. as, as in you will absolutely have to for your own good lightly assert your opinion on what should be happening in the mm -hmm. photographs you're creating as you're working with a client and that's a whole communication dynamic there as far as lightly pushing back and giving your opinion but if this client that you're working with is using you because you're a uh, affordable, they're not going to um, really value your opinion all that much. And you're either going to have to wow them in the immediate with what you're producing, mm -hmm. or if they're still trying to get to something that you're not agreeing with, you're not going to have a lot of clout to correct them verbally, mm -hmm. um, unless they're willing to hear you out and kind of walk through showing that because they're using you because you're cost effective. Now, as you move along in your career and hopefully uh, hone in on that aesthetic, that artist part of the commercial artist, mm -hmm. you start to run into clients coming to you because not because of your pricing, but because other people have recommended you and your aesthetic is something that they want to be a part of. Right. Mm -hmm. So in that instance, your opinion as an artist is different than your opinion as an affordable technician mm -hmm. there's that there's that huge difference there and it's um it's it's a very different communication atmosphere and, and it was interesting in the early part of my career to experience you know a lot more pushback from people on what they wanted to do even when it was a bad idea mm -hmm. in my opinion but at some point i kind of developed a similar thing where I'd kind of assert my opinion like twice. And if they still weren't buying it, I'd be like, you know what, you're paying the bills. So <laughs> yeah, that's where we're going to go. And even now uh, I've, I've allowed for work and reputation to put me in touch with the clients I want to work with. Um, and you still have to, at the end of the day, respect what the client wants. Hopefully you've proven yourself enough to where they'll listen to you and that you mm -hmm. don't have to force your, uh, you know, opinion there. So that, that dynamic of going from not having a lot of uh, power behind your opinion to, I think we should do this. And I just started feeling people meaning like, well, if that's what you think, that's what we're going to do. Because in, in creating images, we know that we want to go that mm -hmm. direction which you know is your opinion so okay so that that made a lot of what we would do sometimes a lot easier but there has to be that confidence as well behind your 
own voice and your own opinion, knowing that this thing that you think actually pans out time after time. It's a hard thing. But no, I think that's a that's an important distinction to make. You always have to remember what is your relationship with the client. It's like their happiness is your money, right? Pretty much. Yeah, their their happiness is you being able to make a living creatively and your ability to make them a happy client that's mm -hmm. a returning client and one that, you know, shows your work to others that hopefully ultimately want to use you as well. Yeah, I think you you have I mean you you elucidated on a lot of points there. You know, how do you elucidated? Know? That's a new word for me. <laughs> you must be a communications person. Uh, might have, might have even made up a word, I don't know. <laughs> so so you can which is it's quite a fun thing to do. Um, but you you uh, through your ability and length of time as a photographer have been able to pick the times and you have some strategies that you have to know well, when when can I kind of assert what I would rather do and not. And I think people under people that are new really need to learn that balance quickly because, mm. you know, if they don't understand it, then they're going to put themselves in trouble if they say, well, I'm an artist. Or, right. <laughs> You're being paid as a technician <laughs> right now, buddy. So get That's in line. Right. <laughs> so learning that balance. And I think that when you learn to um, when you learn to communicate your vision in a way that's going to make them look good. Mm -hmm. then you're not going to run into that that problem yeah and that's yeah. that's the great thing that to mm -hmm. know like all right in this communication situation mm -hmm. i am not an artist at this point in their opinion mm -hmm. so my way of communicating to a better end photo that i think will look better is going to have to come at it in a way to convince them to at least try look and sample in the here and now and mm -hmm. see if they, you know, and be able to communicate it in a way that's not too much like your idea bad, my idea good. Absolutely. We're going to do that. So yeah. the ability to say it, it, it might, if you, if you want to try it, we could look at this pretty quick to see, and it might, you know, you kind of have to carry it along to, you know, kind of. Now, interestingly, I've, I've recently gotten a few jobs there that, that are in a whole nother uh, echelon working with um, advertising agencies and stuff and I've found that it's interesting because the the creative side of it is 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 within much tighter bounds mm -hmm. because they have very very clear brand vision mm. okay yeah. so it's the ability for creativity is is within very limited excuse me, boundaries. Um, but at the same time, they, they, they respect how you want to approach it and what you want to do, but it is very like, that's fine, but we have to do this because this is the brand guideline for this. This is mm -hmm. brand guideline for that. And yeah. it's interesting, kind of a side note, um, no, in this conversation. That's really great because then you're not, so it's, you're taking the baby problem from the portfolio and you're transferring it now to the brand and the brand says this is our baby yeah I mean, this is our baby and you a, will photograph our baby nicely well, it's an identity crisis because yeah. uh unfortunately there's two well there's multiple realms of photography you've got the realm of photography that's out there to make money to make people look good then mm -hmm. you have this other realm of photography that makes money based off of look pe making people look bad so <laughs> which one is that <laughs> well well, I mean, you've got the gossip channels, and you've got the well. Oh. This person did that, and you've got paparazzi. The, oh yeah, yeah. Sometimes they make them look good. Well, sometimes they do, but you know, people. <laughs> uh, if it if it bleeds, it leads. You know, there's a saying in Ooh, the news yeah. literature. So if you can make someone look bad or find something that someone bad did, oh, that's some news where oh, let's go gossip about this. So right. you gotta understand that these people have a potential identity crisis, and they come into you as their identity. I don't want to say doctor. Maybe that's too strong of a yeah. thing to say. But, but communicator of their sure. identity. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, visual communicator of that. All right. So N, mm -hmm. E N, N P E N. Well, we, we we touched on it a little bit, but which you, it's being rather. If something comes up, like so, we've got this critical thing. Learning to be neutral, rather than nasty, negative, or okay. narcissistic. Okay. N is neutral. Yeah. So learn to be neutral rather than negative or narcissistic yeah 
All right. So give me some examples of narcissistic and negative in, in a photography setting, potentially. Oh, man. So you bring the portfolio out and someone says, oh, someone's just looking through it. And they're not thinking. They don't have their filter on. There's, there's, there's people that have different uh, filters over their minds. Some people right. just speak. It's expressive. Then you've got people that are conventional. They use communication as a tool. Uh, it's just, you know, get things done. And then there's, there's this another level. Um, and it's, it's using communication to create. Like, just like you do the, with the photograph, you can use words to create an atmosphere. Right. So right. when you're in that situation, let's say you, all of a sudden it comes out, people are like, well, I don't really like this one. And you go from confident to cocky and say, well, you know, I've been doing <laughs> photography for 20 years and I know that's a good photo. Well, then yeah. you just started an argument. Right. So rather than starting the argument, like, well, who's right here? Well, I am the customer and I think this one's bad. And I like this one. Well, we don't really need mm. to do that. We can just say, okay, well, explain, you yeah. know. Uh, have kind of a neutral tone of voice. As soon as we get negative, then we're still going to clamp them up. They're not going to feel so comfortable. Now there comes a point where some people are too nasty and it's not worth working with them because there are such things as toxic relationships. Oh, yeah. You know, but if it's it's enough of, I, mean, I can work with this person, maybe it's just a slip of the tongue. It's not really who they are. Right. Then r remaining calm, you know, rather than getting all defensive because... Okay, so this yeah. is, the, you know, remaining neutral. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah, it's interesting. In some portfolio meetings, some of my most um, I want to I want to call them best clients because they're they're very very talented, right? Mm -hmm. um, some of them can seem I don't know if aloof is the right word as much as their train is going down their very uh, niche and highly uh, evolved. Uh, practice that they do mm -hmm. and in your you're an, you're a passenger your photos are a passenger on that train they like uh, one of our clients um, he's he's just really precise and good at everything that he does and you you feel like an outside observer to his whole process going on mm -hmm. and he's he's just very tax sharp and and everything he does um, a client up here Rob Witten when I would show him my portfolio He'd comment both on the things he loved and he'd explain why I'd love it. And then he'd also comment on some of the things that he didn't like and why he didn't like those. Mm -hmm. And I kind of wonder if in his wisdom for the years that he's been doing this, if he pointed out the things that he didn't like in a way to see how I'd respond to that. Because mm -hmm. I have a lot of respect for Rob. He's extremely talented, mm -hmm. really pleasant person to be around. And even when he brings up stuff that he, you know, he doesn't think is the best, he does it in a very agreeable and and uh, endearing way, mm -hmm. and and it's is really interesting. But uh, he would he would see stuff in my work that I had s maybe subconsciously included it, not really even thought about it. But he could see it and and spot it, you know. Mm -hmm. And that that was always really interesting. Um, yeah. Okay. So open uh, those that those open that's four yeah can those, i add on to yeah. that what you just said because this is really important especially when you're you know you're on the other side and you're trying to say you're talking to a client you're talking to somebody and um you want to say well this is just good in general people can get away with a lot if they say it in a nice way so i mean <laughs> i'm I'm remembering, I mean, you can really, you, you put a lot of grease in the words, the words can go a lot of places, okay? So I remember right. my first conference as a graduate student, uh, or one of my first conference, and I got a paper accepted, and it got an award, but I, that did not mean that I felt comfortable about it, because I knew at the end of the award, well, first of all, I didn't get the grade I wanted on that paper. Second of all, I was like, okay, whoever's critiquing this paper is going to know you know, what could be better. And then they're going to critique me in public in front of everybody. <laughs> so this person was like, this is what's good. And all of a sudden, okay, now I'm going to tell you a few things that could be better. And they just had this huge smile on their face. And I was like, wow, I'm <laughs> oh, eating no. it up. This is what well, she knows. She was exuding positivity. It was amazing. I could have listened huh. to her critique me for an hour. It right. was just that nice. Because you felt in that moment like she's going to give me something that's going to make everything better. Well, yeah, it was in your best interest. She said, right. well, this is how I think you could go from a regional to a national publication. And it's like, oh, but she said it with really, she said it with a huge smile on her face. I think these things would make it even better. And I was just eating it up. It was, it was probably the best hmm. part of the presentation. Yeah, I mean, I, in architecture school, you'd hear 
uh, horror stories of people's models that they'd present for mm. that studio or whatever that they'd just be getting picked up and thrown and uh, like yeah. some <laughs> some people really go to town on it I guess mm -hmm. luckily we never had much of that um, in our in our studio where we were at but um, so my first question specifically like tips on securing a portfolio meeting like you're calling up uh, like an architectural firm or a publication mm -hmm. to say, hey, I'd love to come show you my portfolio. Uh, do you have time? Could I come in? Blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. What are some general ideas around that initial idea of communication of then securing a potential meeting? I think it's probably going to be over the phone or email. Sure. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I'd go back to the date scenario, uh, you know, because it is a relationship. It's a business relationship. It's not a romantic relationship, but it's no one's going to be typically in a relationship unless they know they're going to get something out of it. Right. So you have right. to show are the benefits greater than the potential negatives. And that's how a lot of people will make their decisions. The on negative is you're taking their time, which is very valuable. Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, or. You know, are you going to make them look good? They're, they're all, they got all these insecurities with a business that's just like you have in a relationship. Mm -hmm. They want to know that you're going to treat them well. So how do you make them know you're going to treat them well? So I think if you can do that research ahead of time, you know, know what their style is. And this could take a long time. Depends on how much time you have to do this. Mm -hmm. But if you have the time and it's a client you really want, then I'd still go research them and say, I noticed that you have these things. And this is the way my business fits those needs very, very well. I have experience in these things. I've helped in such and such projects. And I would focus it on that way because you're going in ahead of time knowing what they want. Right. Yeah. And if you So do, how do I communicate that to them like in a phone call? Like do do I do I come out that direct as far as like I want to work for you, you do this and I will do it well because of or do you do you kind of uh, subtly put it in there. Or is this a cold call or is this like a pretty much cold call? call. Yeah, cold like calling. a solicited call from uh -huh. a potential client is a walk in the park. Yeah. Hey, we love your stuff and we want to see you. You're mm -hmm. already excited and doing great. I spent when I was first starting out, man, days and days and days cold calling people every single day, all day long. Mm -hmm. There's no more of a rejected feel than doing cold calls all day. It's yeah. <laughs> glad that's over but yeah I, th I think that you know I'm not I wouldn't say I'm an expert in cold calling you know that's it's not something that I studied in depth but what I do know is that if you will embrace your service and how your service will help them um, knowing particularly what's it gonna do for them you know are you gonna attract more customers are you gonna put it in a better light mm. are you gonna improve uh, the image you know Talking to their needs, understanding their needs, and making sure you connect with them early and often is going to help you. So Yeah, and imagine if, if you knew their business ahead of time before that cold call and somehow dropped in there a, I really appreciate what you guys do and have done in this in instance, and mm -hmm. I thought it could potentially work well with what I do, and I'd love to show you my portfolio. What you've then said is, like, I value what you do, mm -hmm. and I'd love to partner with you in some way to, you know, help communicate what you do. So. Well, research, well, I don't know if it's research, but this is in the communication textbooks, and that's compliments are like relationship glue. So if you mm. can start out with something positive, then you're automatically connecting with them. Right. You just established that you have a relationship already, at least in thought. Um, you know who they are. It's not just coming out of nowhere. Right. And they'll probably be more receptive to that. You can't do that in every situation. Like I said, it's, it's a matter of time, but I think that will get you a leg up if you do that. Hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, in a portfolio meeting, uh, acronym's the right word for that, right? Open. Mm -hmm. and the acronym seems to cover almost everything in there. Like, just keep thinking of, of those things. You know, show interest by keeping yourself open to them. Stay positive. Um, maintain an appropriate level of eye contact rather than uh, don't stare holes through them <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. and don't just have bad posture and, and look at the floor the whole time uh -huh. and attempt to remain neutral. Um, now, how, how is, explain to me the difference between neutral and positive as, okay. as far as you use them in this acronym. Um, so you have, I'll give you two examples. You've got um, body posture. If it weren't for this microphone, I could Right. Go way back. Or I could have a neutral stance, which is just straight. 
-hmm. or I can lean in when you're talking and I say, man, this guy's interesting. Okay. So you have the, the ability to do that. Right. Um, you can do the same thing with your tone of voice. And this is very, very important. Um, and it's something that has to be kind of, if it's not natural to you, then you have to practice it. So focus on, hey, am I sounding happy? Or, or am I, um, you know, no, my tone of my voice is just straight yeah. static. Hello, There's my nothing name is Trent Bell, and I'd like, like to take pictures for you. <laughs> Basically, you're a robot. Now, that yeah. I would say that's that's definitely neutral, but to negative neutral. Yeah. So everyone yeah. has some intonation. All right. So learning what a happy person is. And you can actually create this. So you can create it through your tone of voice. You can create it with your body posture. Uh, another way you can do it is... Well, first of all, let me just branch into the nonverbal for a second here, because you said you're talking about neutral. Um, most people don't realize that they're sending more channels than they realize. So we have this mm. big name of nonverbal, right? But when you read our lots of communication textbooks, they'll say, "Okay, guess what? How many nonverbal signals are you sending at once? Mm. It's not just once. You s sometimes have, you know, six, seven, eight, nine signals you're sending at the same time." And some of them we talked about, like eye contact or body lean. Then you have the signals of what are you wearing? And you have the signals of oh. how are you paying attention to time? Like, were you on time to the event? Right. Were they on time? That c might indicate, you know, do they care it's about it? a lot of nonverbals, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And then you have, well, what's your environment set up like? Do they feel comfortable in their environment? Hmm. Okay. So you have to think there's all these different things. And then it's not just the clothing you wear, but what's written on the clothing right. you know, these all <laughs> they tell people about tastes <laughs> and <F -H> what <laughs> <laughs> so you have the ability to use all of these things and if you want to be neutral in them you can something uh, some would say you've got this conservative then you could go to flamboyant and mm. you can choose or you, you can do happy colors versus you know the dark colors interesting so you can yeah. you can send all these signals you can create an atmosphere Huh. through all of them and whether and this is the really interesting thing that whether or not you are intending to send them people are picking them all the right, time right yeah yeah huh mm -hmm. that's interesting i don't think i ever thought about that when going to a portfolio meeting i mean it was just like all right i need i need to look slightly better than i normally look <laughs> that's well that's like, a great that's a great start i mean that's the thing that enters most people's minds yeah but and you could take this too far and you know just get nervous about everything right but as long right. as you pay attention to a few key things and you know you're going in the right direction right. yeah and so kind of a, a summary of that would be neutral would be more of um and and uh, a, a neutral attitude of confrontation yeah so, that's what i'm talking about yeah neutral. so right. as far as like oh here's negative feedback oh thank you like how can we right. why do you think that and, uh, okay yeah no that's great that's valuable thank mm -hmm. you you know and then positive is more of a demeanor sure. to, to a degree yeah. in, in conducting yourself. So yeah, okay. the N is more of a what not to do as in stay yeah. neutral if you're tempted to go down. You know, right, right. The, we don't need the smack down. Yeah, right? it's hard for me sometimes if I am in a difficult place e emotionally to not exude that. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm very not good at hiding how I'm really feeling. So that if, if, if I'm in a... Uh, just you know a hard place it's it's very hard to like yeah, you know like, it's, 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 you know well you, know. you can you can work on that well anybody in that situation it's just natural to go down in the dump sometimes yeah but you can bring yourself out by remembering i would say remember what you've done well in the past all mm -hmm. the different successes you've had what got you those successes and you're ready to to uh enunciate clearly what what got you those things Mm -hmm. You know, then you're ready, you know, and I think part of it is being prepared mentally. Part of it is the environment. By the way, uh, some people, uh, even photographers that I read about when they're like they're doing a shoot or they're, they're, they're doing something when you're setting up the environment, sound creates an environment. So some oh, people yeah. might want to put some music on. It's, mm -hmm. it's, up to, it's, you know, it's individual taste. Yeah. Someone was telling me the other day that on on some of the shoots that this that some high end commercial photographer do, he'd have a budget line for like DJ and stuff yeah. and like they'd have a whole thing. And and I I I tend to err on the side of we're here to get this done in the best way possible and those are frills and we're not worried about you know and yeah and i think especially when you consider on on some shoots uh you know you're there as a photographer being very highly paid and the people that are managing you and the relationship to everything that's going on with the brand 
are getting, you know, uh, situationally paid a lot less mm -hmm. and, but they still control like the use of you as far as they've determined, like this company is going to use you yet. They're not paid as well in that situation to, to really thank them in a way that, you know, you provide nice catering and take care of them on the shoot as well. It's, it's a reciprocal Mm -hmm. kind of thing to to remember and to appreciate and and also like if if you're working with an assistant i had an assistant one time you know like went and got me a water and also asked everyone else you know like hey can i get water ready you know and and they really really appreciated that mm -hmm. and that was a, a really nice thing of that person to do so um yeah. anything else on on that piece of it um well i think if we if we always go back to the I mean, it's a good life principle, a good business principle, doing to others what you would have them to do to you. Right. It's called golden rule, the royal loot, whatever you want to call it. But um, in the realm, let's just say we picked the music thing. You know, uh, Some people will say, well, what type of music do you want? And they have right. multiple genres and just play what they want. Right. But any time that you can put in the extra little bonuses of, hey, I'm looking out for you, if they can see that in more than one realm, like this is multiple cues here. So like, I want to help you with your photograph. I want to make sure I'm taking care of your physical needs, your emotional needs, if it's the music or if it's just being gentle, lifting your spirits up. You know, uh, when they see those things, then I think they're going to be more likely to want to come back. And that's yeah. relationally, they feel like that this is a good relationship. Oh, it's yeah. nice to be around this person. Yeah. They're thoughtful. Right. 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 Yeah. I guess that's where um, a lot of times in that dynamic, a, um, a photographer will have a producer or a rep mm -hmm. that will kind of intermediary kind of handle all those things because it can be an extremely high pressure situation if you've got, you know, 10, 15 people that are all there spending their time uh, waiting for you to do this execution of this one thing and either mm -hmm. you get it or you don't. And all of this stuff is just like an upside down triangle on you executing that thing. It can be a very high pressure thing to like make sure you get it right. Cause you know, the reputation of the people that hired you is on the line for their clients mm -hmm. and their brand then essentially. And, and so that can be very high pressure. So they'll oftentimes, all right, you have all these people, coddling that creative environment as far as like just let let that weird guy go in there and do what he does and he's not going to pay attention to anyone else <laughs> and we're going to be the nice people that take care of relationships you yeah. know and at the level that i'm typically working at it's it's usually just myself uh an architect and my assistant and maybe a stylist and someone from their office so it's not a, a as huge of a production mm -hmm. sometimes it is um but yeah that's a an interesting dynamic sometimes in that range. No, I th that's huge. And, and that's really, I think, the thing that most people fear about public speaking. People say, well, they, I fear public speaking. Most people, I don't actually, they don't fear public speaking. What they fear is public embarrassment. Mm. And we can learn from that world and apply it to the situation, I think. It's just a good general principle for anything. The more you prepare and plan for a speech because you know that you're, you have to have something in your head to share with other people and you're afraid that, oh, you, you might not. The more you, the more time you plan and prepare for your photo shoot, I'm sure that just brings and breeds confidence inside of you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've talked to other photographers that um, sometimes get nervous before a shoot, mm -hmm. but I can't remember anymore being nervous before a shoot, even like really, you know, big ones recently, just because it's like, good grief, I've done this so. <laughs> there you go many times i'm yeah. just not worried about it and like all this stuff that's going on out here is such overkill i know i can do this mm -hmm. with none of this anyway so you know there's like there's like a third fourth and reserve shoot for this jump so <laughs> so once you yeah. i mean that's a huge distinction with someone who's comfortable and someone who's not because you have the experience yeah. behind you so if someone was speaking, they pr approach another situation. Well, they have done speaking before. So that's where you're at. But right. people, you know, maybe on the lower edge. Sure. No, definitely. I'm sure I have yeah. been nervous before shoots, but you get to a point where like, I've done public speaking 400 <laughs> times now. And it's just, sorry, right. but I, I know I've it's got this, thing. you know, yeah. that's, uh, yeah. The, and I, I can remember speaking really on a stage for the first time 
and that was just woo. second time was just a little less and mm -hmm. i can imagine it's an exponential growth after that like all right i've done this twice it's right. not you know i survived <laughs> yeah i mean yeah. for you it might be different if you jumped from architectural photography to another realm and i know you branch oh, yeah, out yeah like shooting lifestyle or, sure. or something right. that would like all of a sudden like I don't know this situation. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to, if this goes sideways, I don't know how to save it. Right. It's like yeah. giving a public yeah. speaker say, okay, you got going on stage in five minutes, by the way, we're going to have you talk about something else. A new subject, <laughs> right. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So working with a client, we've kind of touched on that a little bit in the situation where there's the communication of them having a preconceived idea for their brand or for their firm that they want to communicate. So there's going to be this dynamic of them uh, looking at what you're doing and potentially saying not quite. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it, it would seem like at that point, a lot of those same things with your acronym for open is going to come back into to play there. Yeah. And that can be, that can, that can be really hard sometimes, especially at the end of the day when you've been focusing m mental, visual like our brains a lot a pretty large amount of their brain power to visual processing and when you're doing something that's visual processing all day and it has that pressure of everyone spent money to focus on this time for you to pull the rabbit out of the hat here at the end of the day sometimes it's just kind of like i'm not getting it and your your blood sugar is low and mm -hmm. Yeah, that 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 can become a difficult situation when you're when you're stressed and they're like, nope, you're not getting it. That's not it yet. And I don't so how do you cope with that? Because I'm I sure everyone wants to that. know. Um, I don't. I think like a recent shoot we did. Um, you know, it it was we came to this last shot and it was just you just had to know that all right look at what's going on in the frame and really think about what what isn't going on here why are you not feeling this mm -hmm. um and start adjusting individual aspects of things in the frame as you move those pay attention to them and when one thing starts to feel good kind of pin that start to move another thing around, you know, pan, tilt, zoom, you know, uh, and, and then just, it just kind of slowly, we're at the beginning of the day, that whole process is far more fluid mm -hmm. probably. Yeah. Where at the end of the day, it becomes like you have to, you know, on, you have to go into like a safe mode where you're, you're making decisions in a, a very incremental, uh, baby step kind of way maybe yeah. I don't, I don't no, know I think what you're saying is super important that anyone who experiences the the emotional fatigue of if it's create you got a creative process you're reading doing anything mentally long enough you start to notice diminishing in your powers and that's probably the time where um, disaster could strike and the <laughs> sense of uh, it's it's time for me <laughs> to remain neutral. I understand, but I usually you just gotta you know control right, yourself and right. patience. I think if people can understand patience really really well as a photographer, this, they're gonna have a, a step ahead of everyone else. Uh, keeping your calm, mm -hmm. you know, and like you said, having that way mentally to say, okay, here I'm in this situation. How do I work through these steps? It's gonna help anybody. Right. But patience is a really really great thing, uh, especially when you're working with somebody because if they see um they're not patient. Yeah. Then what did you do to the uh, the open atmosphere? It's kind of right. closing the door. You just close the openness, mm. so people can remain patient longer. Then there's still hope. Right. Yeah. So there. Yeah, there was a another shoot we recently did where the shot list was too big for the day, uh -huh. and so there was a lot of like uh, looking at the rest of what we have to get done. It was in a out of, it was out of state we didn't have another day to like all right we'll just come back tomorrow mm -hmm. you know so it's like all right we've got to get this done you have to start making decisions and and being able to say all right we're we're going to have to either say we're not going to get these additional shots and we're going to focus on these or mm -hmm. you have to say all right we're going to get this as best we can and hope that tim the magician that works with me can fix it in post mm -hmm. 
and uh, that I, I've always I've always moved towards, and this is probably a little bit of a slightly non-confrontational um, disposition that I have in some degree, that I will I will inevitably say this is good enough for on site, and I'll push the work till later. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I should maybe push back more on site and, and learn how to effectively and uh, professionally manage the client's expectations, for one, before the shoot, so we don't get ourselves into that situation, uh, but then have that ability on site to do that. And also at the end of the day, when, when you feel like, all right, we got the last one, we're, you know, we're good, uh, whew, that was a lot of work. Oh, this other one I wanted to get, you know, like, <laughs> you know, it's, and at that point to keep telling yourself, like, remember that job you had in a pallet factory, uh-huh. you're not in a pallet factory and you have the ability to, uh, manifest patience to go the extra mile. You're, you're very, um, you're very, look, you're talented and everything else to be here, but you're also lucky. Mm-hmm. So suck it up (laughs) the client's right and be patient be polite and go the extra mile and a lot of people i think i've heard horror stories about people losing it like i hear a lot about photographers losing it and throwing tantrums and stuff and Mm -hmm. i to me i just always i just return to my my horrible place of working in a pallet factory and it's just like yeah this is easy. I got this. Like you want to take another pretty picture. Yeah, we can do that. Mm-hmm. At least I'm not stapling pallets together all day long. So, <laughs> well, I think what you, you mentioned is, is important. And if, if you can build, I mean, any business does this, which it builds in a buffer zone. Like they understand how much money they need to operate and they need to make profits beyond that. Mm-hmm. And you can do the same thing in business planning and the same thing in communication. Mm. So when we say be positive, you're building a buffer zone for when the conflict comes well, you have something already established that, you know, you're right. a likable person. If, if you didn't have any likability in you and then all of a sudden the conflict comes, then it's just going to de- dive deep fast. And I think what you said is having the expectations ahead of time is, okay, this is how much we can do. This is how much we can do in one day. And, and being really clear with that and building buffer zones into that, you know, having extra time here and there is going to save huge on stress, um, you know, and I know you know this as a planner, but just having a little bit of extra time here and there to do what you need to do. But those expectations up front, it's like when someone starts a relationship, so what are we doing, what, what do we not do, and when, whose parents' house are we going to? And you know, knowing all those things is gonna save you big time, and you already said that. It's just, right. I think, something that people really need to emphasize. And I know some, some guys are really helpful in this, and this is a, fo- a portrait photographer, and he said, okay, you're coming, you're gonna come to the photo shoot, and what he had on, on, on his website was a huge list of things. Well, here's like 15 things you can do to make sure you look pretty and ready. So when we, you get there, mm-hmm. this is going to be successful. Right. And I, do you think that would be something, I don't know, in a commercial shoot, if that would be helpful or not? Well, yeah, with us, we'll, I'll generally tell people that um, so we're not diverting too much of our cognitive ability during the shoot. Mm-hmm. You might want to have someone go and roughly style each composition that will be shooting in your office space or home or whatever the day before. Yeah, it's good so idea. when you get there, all the clutter's out, everything's clean, you know, so you're there just slightly moving things, composing and lighting rather than cleaning and removing things and, and everything else. That's a, a huge no, that's thing great. for pre-production. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, also that clear communication ahead of time, putting that effort into being clear on expectations uh, is very important. And it's always that kind of odd pushback, like you want to give everything to secure a job, Mm -hmm. but then if you give too much, one, you're not gonna have anything to give later if you run yourself into the ground, Mm -hmm. and you're also going to cut your quality if you promise too much ahead of time and then you get to location and you like don't deliver on what they thought they could get you know right and so learning that ability to properly and politely um hand uh 
expectations and reality to a client in a positive way mm -hmm. is, is a difficult thing. So I, I have some friends who work in the architecture world that'll just be extremely blunt from the outset. They're like, no, you can't do that for this amount. It's going to cost that much. And I don't have any more time to deal with you at this point. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, some people can get behind that and they're like, mm -hmm. oh, wow. All right, you're you're not mincing words here, I, mm -hmm. and then other people are just like, well, <laughs> you know. So it, I think it, you know, you have to read the people you're with and and understand right. when to, when to be blunt and when not, and that's kind of part of a subjective nature of of communication and relationships, anyways. So yeah, and you do get away if you can keep that calm, open, positive tone. You can uh, you can get away with a lot. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay, so my last kind of uh, communication dynamic I'd like to talk about is uh, working with an employee. So as a photographer, you your most likely employees are going to be a uh, studio manager, retoucher, and uh, assistant on set. Mm -hmm. Or other people, uh, like we had a stylist that was technically em employed by me when we were doing a shoot recently, and, uh, you know, a caterer and... Um, you know, multitudes of other people that are working for you in service to the whole shoot. What are some very important things to remember when you're working with people that are working for you? Uh, so you know, uh, let's focus on the employee for a second. Mm -hmm. So or employees situation. Sure. So there's a book that I read in organizational class at Western Michigan University. What is organization? Organizational. Organizational, or organizational class. Yeah. Uh, organizational communication. Let me clarify. Okay. okay. So you know, how do you communicate in an organization? How do you create a culture? Gotcha. How do things work well? And so I analyzed a book. Uh, it's a business classic. A lot of people regard it as a very great book. It's by Peters and Waterman. It's called In Search of Excellence. Mm. So they went out and they just dug through all the companies and said, okay, who's sustaining on a consistent upward trend? Why and how did they get there? And they go through all the reasons. And they, they in their book, they say, someone came to us and said, you know what? They should have put communication in this book as something that's important to organizational excellence. And they didn't put it in as its own section, but they have things spread out in there. So I think a couple things that would really help an organization, and this is what they say, to create the culture you want is to tell stories. So if there is someone mm. with a vision leader, um, you know, you got different executives you could think of, Steve Jobs or um, in the past, and you've got other ones in the future. I mean, there, there's a lot of telecom companies where people are changing. Some of them grew the business, and they grew it by creating a culture. And... You can create a culture by telling a story. Uh, one example is, and I wouldn't, don't know if I would go this far, but it, it gets the point across, was there is this, there is this um, department store, and this lady comes in, and she's just so mad that the tires they sold her were no good. And she was mad long enough where they said, okay, we're going to help you out, lady. But they didn't even sell tires, but they took them anyways. So that's like when someone hears that story, and you're like, I want you to have good customer service. They remember the tire story, and all of a sudden, you know, they have something to do. Now, it's not, I'm not saying I would create that, but whatever it is that you want to create, you have the ability by, you know, rituals you have in your office. Is it greetings that you have, or is it little um, interesting things you do with your staff? Um, is it, do you, you tell them stories of how you want them to act, and then you tell a story of someone who did it in that way, and then it just sticks in their minds, and they're going to, they have something to emanate. So one way is hmm. telling stories. Um, another way that's definitely the, the simple and easy way is to have, you know, organizational policies. And that's always like uh, more rules. And I don't think you should have a lot of rules. I think you should have a few rules that are well worded and that allow for some flexibility. And then people know, okay, what do I expect? What's he right. expecting? So um, I think those are two really big ones. And then, if you're dealing with, uh, you know, I had to deal with more conflict than I've ever had uh, in a long time in a, in a recent, one of my recent jobs. And I, I learned more how to deal with it. I learned how to stay calm. And if you need a new behavior, there's, there's, we have to be comfortable, especially if you're in a leadership position, you know, asserting yourself. You can't just not say anything and the, and the ship goes down, right? 
and it happens sometimes a small hole will sink mm. a big ship right yeah so we got to correct people and the best way to do it and in, in, well one way to do it is the sandwich method sandwich oh, method yeah, sandwich okay. method yeah so you've got uh, you know you've got two layers of bread and you've got something good inside so start with something positive give them the meat so this is what we need to do differently and then you end with something positive again or saying this is how i think the organization is going to work better if we do it differently but if you start positive then you don't start in threat mode and they feel comfortable they feel valued mm -hmm. and you're creating a positive atmosphere hmm. yeah all right interesting yeah. and we could take that a little further if you wanted to so uh let's see so walk me through a situation where uh a photographer could have a potentially uh some situation with an employee mm -hmm. that uh they need to this behavior is happening no good need to get the whatever it is to be better sure like uh how so we could just take one example let's say they're late and you have a couple options here in conflict management and there's you can talk about the topic you can talk about their identity mm -hmm. you can talk about there's a couple other communication things that you could go to but the most uh, the two that you deal with most is topic and identity now they're talking about what someone did versus who the person is. And if you can focus on the behavior mm. versus the person. So what's the okay. difference? Okay. Hey, I noticed you came in late versus, Hey, you're lazy. So <laughs> the first one you talked about a specific behavior. The second one, you attacked a baby, right? <laughs> you're attacking their character. Oh, that's a, yeah, that's an interesting point. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so then you can just say, this is what happened. And then you can say, this is what you'd like instead. You can start it with, Hey, you're usually on time give people the benefit of the doubt. I know something was probably going on. Describe what you want. Another way you can do too, to make it really easy for them, because it's not like you're trying to put a guilt trip on somebody, but there's no way they can deny that they did something wrong. If you say, how did this affect me? Because you were late, I had the photo shoot late. I missed the golden hour. Um, right. And the picture didn't have quite the right color. So, you know, so you're describing and it's very clear in their mind and they're not gonna wanna do that to you again. Or if you just say, hey, quit being so lazy, you know, <laughs> or you're just starting a fight. <laughs> right. How do you, how do you, um, I guess this is more of a psychological question, mm -hmm. but like I'm so non-confrontational non and uncomfortable, like in that type of a scenario, like mm -hmm. how would a person get themselves to get past that and, and say the things that need to be said to hopefully get a better functioning chip I'm, I'm that way too and this last you know last several years of my life have helped me get out of that and it's just realizing that um, it's part of business and as long as you have a reasonable you know what you're saying is reasonable you're not saying please take this hammer and as hard as you can slam it against your foot it's not what we're asking people and it feels like that sometimes when you Oh, this is going to be uncomfortable. But often a lot of people, if you just say something calmly, like I used to compliment people a lot and say, okay, this is what we need to do differently. Like, hey, the type of personality I am, I don't mind if you just tell me. Um, and that takes, well, I think what we're mostly afraid of, I don't know if it's this is you, but a lot of people is, ah, oh, here it comes. I'm going to have to tell them something. They're going to get defensive and here 100%. we go. <laughs> so... If we can, uh, sometimes we, we feel that inside of us mm -hmm. and then we approach the situation. Uh, I know you really need to do this differently because we've talked about this a hundred times. So if we can just take that, it's hard to get that spirit out of us and approach it in the, in the gentle, meek spirit. Right. Um, you, you can turn away the wrath if you're very gentle. So I think if we approach it gently and just a matter of factly like, hey, this is a better way to do it, you know, just approach it that way. Hmm. You're not really insulting them. Hmm. It's just a matter of fact. All right. I can yeah. do that. I can do that. Mm -hmm. I can I can be a better person to work for. <laughs> <laughs> That's hard to do, right? You have to, and this is the thing, is we, we, we hang on things in the past. When someone does it again, it's still in our mind, and it comes front. Right. But if we remember, <laughs> this, is, this is tough for me, too. Like, I had to learn something new, too, once. And I appreciate bosses that have been patient with me. And it's hard to bring back to the forefront. But we got to do that sometimes. Yeah. yeah. 
So any anything else we're missing that you think might be uh, a surface level of value and, and obviously what you can go to a doctorate level of understanding <laughs> and, and have a lot more than an hour and, and some conversation on, but uh, yeah. anything further you think we're missing as an intro to this? Um, well, if, if you stick in the realm of commercial photography, I, this is just a very interesting thing that someone said, and um, it kind of encapsulates this whole, well, we've got communication, and we have how we say the communication. I think it's just kind of a good summary for it, because we've talked about openness, psychological closeness, all sorts of things. But someone said, the, this was a photographer, he said, the picture you take is going to reflect who you are and how you make yeah. people feel. Yeah, so. I believe that. The uh, I've I've said this with a couple different people. I think that uh, you you're you're using everything you've experienced and everything you've felt mm -hmm. to inform how you solve the problem of only being able to see whatever it is you're focusing on in this two-dimensional essentially you know or this you know in this single frame right i think you took a, that to a new dimension and, and what i said was more in the in the sense of it, it so if you're doing not commercial photography if you just have a person there well how do you make them feel the the better you make them feel happy the less they're going to have to fake that they're happy in the photograph and the more likely oh, yeah, you are yeah, to no. get an authentic like a picture you know yeah that and i've i've had a couple people in the studio recently that we did headshots for and stuff and i'm i'm not a touchy feely <laughs> guy and uh like uh my friend josh is is very much that way and you uh -huh. just warm up to him and right. you know he's great at it um and the trick i've found is just to ask people to give us your best fake smile yeah. and if they do a fake smile and then like they laugh at themselves afterwards that's when you then get you that it. moment of the real <laughs> smile funny. so right. it's the compensation for my lack of uh teddy bear attitude so yeah. or approachableness mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming in and talking me through these things. It's definitely an area where I need uh, a lot of um, active thought in, in everything that I do, and I need to keep growing in it. So I really appreciate you coming in. And again, this is Robert Rice, Dr. Robert Rice. Um, and let's see, had I I'd written that down on my phone where we can, where can we find you again if we want to get more Robert Rice? Strategicatmosphere.com strategicatmosphere.com awesome well thanks so much for coming in really and enjoyed I, it i appreciate you having me on as a blast thanks